Um, hey Suki, how are you doing? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Very, very well. Um, I'm in Devon at the moment and the sun is absolutely shining. I don't know uh, where you are at the moment, but like I, a lot of people, a lot of my guests talk about weather because I always talk about weather. I always talk about the sun is the most important thing. And today it's really sunny. And for the last five days, we've had rain. So whereabouts are you? You got some sun. What's going on? Um, I have a little bit of sun. I mean, I'm also in the UK, actually. I'm kind of oh. trapped, marooned here. Um, but nowhere as glitzy as Devon, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it is a relatively sunny day, but I am far from from my usual haunts. Let's, like, when, <laughs> let's when, put it that when way. When someone says they're marooned, I just imagine that TV program Lost. I'm like, everyone, <laughs> just, just, everyone just got lost and they don't know where they are, like searching for somewhere. But I'm hoping you're not in a situation at lost. You're in a very comfortable situation. I hope. hope yeah, so. I am. It, existentially, perhaps less so, but definitely physically, I am. I'm in a. I'm in a nice place right now. So first, first I want to get the elephant out of the room. How has your lockdown been? Because we're now in lockdown three. Have you been in the UK for most of the lockdown since um, March? So kind of i i actually came into i i dropped myself into the lockdown so i came in from la and then once i was in i almost couldn't leave um briefly i left um for work i was in greece and cyprus and then once things started getting really dire i decided no i'm gonna stay in one place just be responsible and you know nothing's getting filmed at the moment but even if it were i think i would want to just stay in one place right now because it's just the right thing to do so, yeah, it's yeah. just crazy, isn't it? So was it, when you were kind of like in LA just before you went to the UK, was LA sort of like, it, did it? Did people also know that there was a virus happening? Because when we were in the UK, like I remember like February, March, people kind of knew about it, I knew about it. And then people, I was on a job and people, started, and this is like early March, people started crying around me. And that's when I knew it was a bit serious. I was like, okay, people are crying now it's quite serious. Like, what was it like yeah. around that time? It was bizarre because it like went from zero to a Will Smith movie really, really quickly. Like one minute we were having meetings. I mean, I was just on the verge of an amazing project um, opening place and so many incredible meetings. And that was normal and it was buzzing. The show had just come out that on Netflix. And then the next day it was like, there's this zombie virus that's like a really honestly the American news station like, there's this zombie virus that's like killing everyone <laughs> don't leave your house or you'll die and it was like wow. mass panic and everyone was kind of if you sniffed you were like oh my god I'm contagious it was so it was almost like hysterical and um people just didn't know what to do like people were mass mass hoarding and I didn't know what to do. So I honestly made that call in, in the 24 hour period. I didn't know what to do. And I thought to myself, right, I need to get on the flight and I need to be, I need to protect my parents. That was like, my first thought was I need to protect my parents. My parents are in the UK. I'm getting on a flight right now. So literally that night that the news story came out, um, I don't remember this, was it on CNN? I can't even remember. I literally booked a flight. And then that next morning I flew in, I just, I kind of mostly stayed in the UK, pretty much stayed in the UK and I've been there ever since because yeah, then then things really started unraveling. And in part, we felt like it wasn't that serious. Mm -hmm. But as things progress, kind of is that serious. So yeah, here we find ourselves. It's what, one year, two months later. It's crazy, isn't it? Like I I I was I was literally about to go to LA. No, I would no, so I was in a I was in LA. And then I was going to go to New York and then I was going to travel around for a bit. And so like my plans were like totally like crumbled. Like I was like, this is not happening. So I migrated back down to Devon where I'm currently at the moment. And it's been, it's quite been quite actually nice though. To, I've, a lot of my friends are based in the city and some of them have kind of escaped, but it's quite nice when it is a sunny day, generally it's not, but when it is a sunny, like a sunny day, there's so many things you can do in, in the countryside. So it's great. You, you, you do feel like there is a lockdown, but there is, it isn't in a way because there's like beaches, there's like the moors, there's like the sea. It's so great to kind of have like explore different things. And I think, I think a lot of people have, have reflected going, do I really need to be in the city life? Especially my yeah. friends who live in New York, they're like, 
I don't need the hustle and bustle. And I think what we are experiencing now is people who are just going like, well, why do I need to work in an office now? And so freelance and also freelancers it's totally changed our game as well, the way that we will work now for the future. Yeah, but I think it's also like what you were saying, the simple things in life. It's almost if you are fortunate enough to be in a position where you've gone from a hustle and bustle, because not many people are fortunate enough to have this conversation. I mean, they really hardly hear it. But if you are so lucky almost to go from that back to something that's stripped back is very, very eye opening. And I think it does change you and really reassess your priorities because We've all just been so go, go, go. And social media has kind of like exasperated this intense sense of rush, yeah. unnecessary sense of rush, really. And I think just to strip it back to what really matters, mm. it changes you in a way that I don't think you'd ever go back again. I don't, I think I have been, I don't know about you, but I think I have been monumentally changed just like my priorities have absolutely shifted in a way that I, I wouldn't want to recover from, to be quite honest with you. Because mm-hmm. I think, I, think I, I talked to a lot of people about the industry and like how thing, a lot of things were wrong about it. Like we talk about the film industry, fashion and music, especially with budgets and the way things were casted and who was involved and stuff. And it was such a, on a hamster wheel, but now we've like kind of stopped. Well, not now, but, but when we did stop, it was, a t- it was a time and place for people just to reflect and go, actually, we know these things don't work. Now there is a time, because it's stopped now, to fix these things so we can think about it. If not, beforehand, it was just like, go, 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 go. We know, it, we know that just, this doesn't work, but how do we fix it? Because the, the machine's got to keep running. Um, yeah, I, thank you for saying that. Yeah. I think, it really, I think it really did amplify voices that weren't able to jut into the conversation, or if they were, it was going to take way longer. I mean, you saw it with... Um, the Black Lives Matter movement, you saw it with now Asian shows coming out on television. And I think these conversations have been given more breathing space and more attention because you almost had to force the world to have nothing else to talk about for the uncomfortable conversations to be addressed. Mm -hmm. That's, that is, think about that. I mean, that's shocking. Uh, Grateful, of course, but like, wow shocking but I'm so glad it happened and hopefully we can continue that I will say something though somebody said to me um I don't know whether it's because I'm biracial people feel like that sometimes they can say things to me and it not be the wrong person (laughs) is the wrong person to say it to but somebody said to me do you know what it's so difficult as a white actor and white producer right now to make shows no and I I swear down, I swear down they said that to me. And do you know what? It just made me think, do you know what? How uncomfortable do you think that we have felt? Because we've been saying that exact same sentence for over a hundred years. Yeah. I'm glad it's on, I'm glad it's difficult. But I, you know, it and you shouldn't make it. I don't want to make everything hyper politicized, but to be honest with you, I, I describe it akin to an abusive relationship where one person has had a chance to speak and they've absolutely dominated the conversation. This other person that the abused almost needs to now have a moment and start dominating the conversation to the extreme the other way for it mm-hmm. to swing back to normal. So anyone who kind of says, oh, but you guys are getting so much attention, it's so difficult. I think that needs to happen. Absolutely, 100% that needs to happen and be uncomfortable and be that extreme in order for us to reach a plateau. But we should eventually reach a plateau. Yeah, because for years and years, you never had the attention. So now you need to really, really build that attention. So then eventually, because obviously it's things that like, <laughs> once, because obviously the attention on, it's like society, like things have its like attention there, there's attention there because we're very, but once it's had its like its plateau, it should e- or should even out back to yeah. what it should do. I that, mean, that. In, a, in an abusive relationship, you don't just forgive the burden of comparing it to that, but you don't just forgive the person and not have your peace and then move on. Yeah. You've got to say your peace yeah. if you want to create and, right. and been, then move on. But there's been a lot of like kind of abuse uh, stories that have come out or not abuse, about abuse accolations from like FK Twigs that I recently listened to her podcast. And I was, I, I've, I, I have a couple of friends who've been in abusive relationships and 
because I'm so um, innocent in my mind, I don't, I, I don't think, I don't believe that people do this sort of thing, that people can actually manipulate people in those sort of relationships. And listening to this FK Twigs thing, I was like, as if this mental person is like asking, like one of the things he was like saying was like, you can't look at men in the eye. And I was like, I was listening to going, as if someone's asked someone that, to do that. That's just like mental. And it's just like raising these voices mm -hmm. even more so now, because it's just, like, it's just, it's disgusting that people can do that mm. to tell people to someone else how to live their life like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I conversations like that, conversations like the one I mentioned, I'm just glad that these conversations are happening. And if anything good has come out of such a horrific pandemic and situation, it is that conversations that matter are now happening in a way that they couldn't have happened before. Mm. So. Because, because obviously people's careers have either like put on like a, a, a full stop or some careers that people have been doing stuff, I think probably from like June, July, especially in the filmmaking world, because you've you got the kind of um, the health and safety uh, approval. But in terms of like the progress of society and culture has literally tenfold moved forward and evolved so much. Last year. And so when some people say like, oh, nothing really happened last year, I was like, are you mental? Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> last year, like, just because we are locked down doesn't mean things didn't happen. So much happened last year that rocked society. And you just go like, how can that not be like something that's happened? Like there is- You know what? I think that happens because people are so used to things happening, being quantified by what you can post on Instagram that, they have become a unaccustomed to things that happen in the real world and have real life consequences that can't be cutely framed in front of a nice backdrop that isn't your home. Mm. I said, what is it? <laughs> yeah. So I, but before we move on, I would, I'd love to go back because I want to know how you came into the industry and your burlesque work and what sort of thing. I'd love to know where it all started. So tell me from the start. Wow, I mean, I wouldn't want to bore you with every single convoluted <laughs> twist and turn on that journey. But in summary, um, I'm biracial. I'm half Indian, Singaporean, half British. And I was raised in an extremely, 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 extremely hyper conservative traditional way. Um, pretty much more Asian than Asian, even though my mom's British. Um, she's right. very conservative and all her family work for the church. So, um, I didn't get any leeway on that side. Um, so yeah, my parents were very, very much of the ilk that science is the way forward and you can't do anything else. And even though I grew up with this um, incredible artistic brain and innate sense of art and wanting to be an artist mm -hmm. um, and being hyper-performative just in everything I do. I mean, I can't stop gesticulating, so that pretty much says it all right there. But um, they wanted me to be a scientist and there was no real movement on that. And so I ended up compromising, doing geography, going into IT, teaching myself IT, getting a job in IT. But even though I was good at it, I was really, really unhappy in this bland corporate environment and it just wasn't me it just absolutely wasn't me and I think that if you have something in your heart enough you just can't repress who you really are and that it was when I was discovering myself I got into vintage fashion the pinup look which was finding my way really in the world and my place I heard about burlesque and it was game over because that was an art form excellent you could get on stage and express yourself. There were no rules and it embraced something that was a massive taboo in my household and my culture, which was female sexuality. And I think that's just when I had to be a part of it. There was, it was just no question. I didn't even think about the consequences of that. It was my own personal journey and this is what I had to do. And so I ended up um, marching into a theater that was actually auditioning for burlesque dancers uh -huh. um, and saying, with my friend, I'm a pro professional burlesque artist, I wasn't, um, hire me, I wanna do these shows. It, it was almost like the universe put something in your path and you have to take it. Mm -hmm. um, so they gave us a week because they believed us and I had to learn burlesque off of YouTube. I'd never done it before. And um, the first show I did was in a theater to about, about 300 people. Um, and that was my first experience of burlesque. I had seven days and 
we did the show. It was it was horrendous. Stuff went wrong. Like I got, I didn't know how to undress in a manner that was <laughs> artistic. Yeah. Um, I kind of just loosely interpreted yeah, burlesque. But... The most simplest thing is that is that what, what's that fav famous woman in the hourglass? Uh, Dita Von Teese. Yeah, like when she like does like really simple something so simple, right. like just like a shoulder. It's so yeah. well choreographed, and that's what you. It's uh, so uh, I mean, I had. I'm gonna not like you. I had zero finesse. And on occasion, still now, I have <laughs> zero finesse in that respect. But I brought something that all, the audience loves, which was relatability and making women feel like they could take control of their bodies, they could empower themselves. And the audience absolutely loved it. And then luckily, they asked us to come back and I grew and developed my art and I honed my technique and who I was and my identity and then made a career out of it. But that's like a very unusual <laughs> way into it. And um, since then it's kind of progressed into television. So I guess it was not something that I planned. I never kind of was a kid in school and thought, oh, I want to be a burlesque dancer. I never yeah. thought that it was something that happened, but I think I knew I was different and I had something to say and I wanted to change the world. And I just happened across an art form that allowed me to say what I wanted to say. Mm. How so? When when you decided to do this and you got the job, what what was the kind of conversation with your family? I'd love to know that because like, there's so many. No. People, because like, there's so many people that I know that their family, uh, their their dancers or their actors, but their family go, we we don't really support it, but we'll let you do it but we don't come for us for money and finances. But like my family are very, very, I mean, my family are in the arts. So it, oh, wow. like downstairs now, my, my sister's singing Le Mis. Like <laughs> literally it's a, it's a very fam famous, like theatrical kind of family. Of um, so what, what was the kind of conversation with your family about kind of the work that you, you were like, I don't want to do the corporate life. I want to go into this, this new area. What, 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 what's your thoughts? I didn't tell my parents and I didn't tell my family and I actually hid it from them because I knew the consequences of that and I knew it wasn't going to be good. I mean, my dad's side of my family is incredibly, incredibly strict and traditional Indians and it just wasn't going to fly. So I hid it from them and I told everyone I was still in IT because I was terrified of the consequences, really genuinely wow. terrified. And um, it was when I was recovering in hospital um, from just just a mild, mild illness. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I ended up being in hospital. My mom called me. And of course, my surname's not seen here. And my mom called me and she, and there was like a bizarre silence. Like there wasn't empathy that I was in hospital. It was like bizarre silence. And she goes, so Suki, Singapore. And I just went, shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, You'd be so bumped. she googled me she'd found out she had the power to cut me down and she did she did and then I, I laugh about it but it was it was I knew then this was about to get really difficult for me and it really really did it got really really difficult and um there was a lot of uncomfortable conversations a lot of crying a lot of hurt and years of pain and anger and trying to justify myself to them and trying to prove to them that I was good enough which in hindsight that almost drove my need my need to be accepted by the public because it was filling a gap for me where I wasn't accepted by my own family of course yeah yeah and then it took family tragedy to strike for my parents to slowly start to come around and eventually brave filtering the news out to not all but a lot of my family in Singapore. Mm. Um, and eventually they, they, they now have kind of come with Netflix as well and it being on TV, so a little bit more acceptance and being invited to Buckingham Palace, even more slight acceptance. Yeah, it, yeah. It's now in a place where they don't understand what I'm doing, but they are slowly and tentatively supportive. But still, as long as I start to now dumb down the conversation and, and, and almost mainstreamify myself. Um, so there is that like finding your way, but it's easier now, but definitely, <clears throat> I mean, I wouldn't want to go into it too much because I am grateful of the middle ground that we've now all reached. And I'm so yeah. grateful that they have come to accept me, but 
to say that it wasn't very, very difficult uh, would be a disservice because it was tough. Um, so as well as that, I think now in everything that I do, I do with a sense of wanting to make sure that no other young Asian or young kid going up against their family ever has to experience anything like that. And I think shouting like your sister or singing from the rooftops and um, proclaiming that, yes, we are credible human beings and we can make a career out of this is even more so important because we have a responsibility not to let this happen to other people. Yeah, so true. And it's it's about it's about kind of like allowing that the community around us and the environment, because it was back in the UK, I think it was a couple of months ago, that the government would like cut in costs on the arts and saying the arts is kind of like irrelevant and then going like, essential. <laughs> yeah, and it was a bit like, what about Netflix? What about all these actors? What about all these entertainment? And just go like, they are all in the arts. It's not just like theatre people, it's people right. who do like Amazon. And, and, and so I was a bit like, are you mental? Because everyone's watching Netflix at the moment in lockdown. If you didn't, if we didn't have Netflix and Amazon, what would people be doing? Like we, we would go I, like 20 years ago, like we would right. read newspapers, but you then you've got to have people who are artistic to write the art newspapers. So you're just like, right. Yeah, it's kind of like how I see it is like sciences allow you to survive, but arts allow you to live. Mm. That's, you know that's a really good quote. Hundred percent. Because art is all around. 100%. Art is literally like yeah. I talk to my friends about this. Like we t we 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 take so much uh, away from our actual initial space because we're so in our heads. That actually, if you look at the, if you try to simplify your life and just look around you, that everything has been designed literally for its purpose around you. And so, when you think about like a bed sheet or like a certain um, furniture, everything has been designed like by a creative to, to serve a purpose. Yeah. And then you think about that, who designed that, you just go, the whole, the whole space of you is 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 art, and it is yeah. influenced by something else, and you can be influenced by it to make your own art and I and then when you look at that from like a zoom 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 you just like yeah wow people cool. yeah <laughs> that's mad oh my god that's so cool that you said that because have a think about imagine if we could only choose one style of bed which was like square Bauhaus and the sheets are just all white plain if you have a preference on bed sheets you support the arts <laughs> Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And there and ergo, but also as well, mental health. I mean, have a think about where we would be if we couldn't have tuned in and watched television or if we couldn't have listened. Can you imagine where we'd all be if we couldn't have listened to music during lockdown? I mean, How it lives me every single day. I can't, I, I have um I have speakers in my bedroom, but I also have speakers in the shower. So I can <laughs> So I can always have music on all the time. And I'm always, if I'm working, I have to have music on. Music is literally within my soul. And I think everyone can relate. I don't, I, you, you know, the people in busk, people who busk, right? Yeah. And then I, these, these are the people I don't trust, right? So the people who are watching this busker, right? And then this person's jamming out and really pour, pouring his soul out. And I'm watching and I'm literally just like, I'm, I'm in it. I'm like moving. I'm sort of like, I'm kind of like in this moment. And people just like do nothing. They're just like standing there, not even moving, not even reacting to this thing. And I'm just like, are you even listening to this person? Yeah. How does the music not make you move? I think that, to be honest with you, I think that's, a, that's also fear because um, it, it's fear of human interaction. I, I, I honestly believe it. I think that, because I'm quite socially awkward. So in my defense, I am on occasion, I'm sometimes one of those people but in my head, I'm, I'm crying because it's so wonderful. But I, I'm very bad at um, visually expressing myself in that, in that way, in that circumstance, because mm. I am so socially awkward. I fear, because if you're like, <laughs> I fear an interaction, because if I super, super appreciate like a busker right. and I'm just like, yeah, and they're like, yeah, then there's now communication and I, I'm a buffoon about it. I fumble. Why but sometimes I can like gear myself up and I'm just like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I'm like an introverted extrovert. It depends on the day. But on some days I actually fear the communication back. 
And so I'm unable to physically, <laughs> I know that sounds weird. I don't know why I'm sharing this, but I feel like unable to physically express my enjoyment because I'm afraid of the like communication back. Odd. That's so so it's not always that we don't appreciate, although I think there's a lot of that, but there's not always that we don't appreciate buskers. Sometimes awkward people like myself are just desperately wanting to sway, but afraid that the other person is going to say hello. Yeah, or, or, I, think, or, I think also it's down to that idea of, I don't know, being judged. I think there's an element of that as well. Like if one person's <laughs> doing it in the audience, but no one else is doing it and everyone's being like, what's this guy doing? And I think this is a bit of like, I remember one time, years and years and years and years ago, I was doing it and someone thought I had ADHD. And I was like, I don't have ADHD. I'm t and there's nothing wrong with having ADHD, but like, I, I just was just like enjoying myself in this crowd. Because yeah. everyone was kind of like being normal. And I was just like grooving, just enjoying myself. And I was just like living my best life. And I love that. someone told me and I was like, ah, oh, right, okay. And it's just, it's strange to me that I'm just like, why, I, why should I give anything about someone's opinion who I prob probably would never see ever again in my initial circle, maybe because obviously the, si the five, six degrees of se separation, I'm probably so yeah. close to this person, but actual, in my actual small circle, I'm never going to make this person again, even, and I probably won't even know what they're even thinking, but they might just give me a bit of a look and I'm like, well, look on, just... <laughs> enjoy no enjoy don't life. don't let anyone's opinions change you honestly Please. seriously because I, I like that there are awkward people like me and expressive people like you and it and we need a variance of oddness in order <laughs> to create great things that people haven't seen before so please sure. stay weird and I will stay awkward and <laughs> But that's my, the best my, way to be my dad says this really simple thing he says it takes all sorts in this world so yeah is. Very, very simple thing. And I've always I've always looked at that going like there needs to be someone who's in charge, someone who doesn't want to be in charge, someone who is a follower, all these different types of people, people who are introverted, people who are not introverted, because we, we, if we were all the same, we all would be fighting for the same position and the world wouldn't, wouldn't work. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that pretty much was indicative when Smarties brought back the blue colour and everyone was really excited. So if you're one of those, support people who aren't. <laughs> yeah, I, I, do you know, do you know, I've read recently, um, this is very strange. I don't know if you're, um, is it, the, the, you know, the tea company, what's it called? The really famous tea company. Um, you have to be a bit more specific. I think York, the Yorkshire P, P, uh, uh, P and G, I think it's P and G. Okay. P and G, really randomly, don't know why. But um, I read recently, this is a, this is a sort of British thing, that they made a new tea, I think it is, called Jam and Scones, or something, it's this new taste. Really, right. really randomly. And I'm like, okay. for me, this goes back to the creativity sort of thing, that someone has decided, I, what I love is about people who have these visions or have these things, and they just go and act on it. Like, no one's kind of like, well, some, maybe someone has insp in, inspired them. But someone has taken the initiative going, you know, it'd be really great, jam and scones. Or I even think about like the idea of like um, why things become, like where did the idea come from someone's head to make uh, a Netflix, for instance, a Netflix show called Singapore Social? Why did someone decide to do wheat and I don't know, whatever it is to make bread? Like all these things about creativity, like thoughts of, Thought, like unconscious thoughts and conscious thoughts I'm fascinated by that about where do ideas come from and creativity come from yeah and I'm glad that people so the fact that you know about it means that also another creative has gone yeah and greenlit that and that yeah. makes me happy as well because I'd like to think that any idea that I came up with no matter how wacky there's a human out there that would go makes total sense oh you want to okay you want to carve a hat out of your hair total sense i'm on board do you know i love that i love the other people i love the people that think of these things i love the people that support those people because they're 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 fully in <laughs> but also you need to find those people because not everyone is going to be fully in like i don't know if yes. you've read, if you uh, watched breaking bad but recently i've just oh yeah i've just finished it season five because um uh i was watching something uh, this guy who's a um 
the original uh, development uh, producer for Netflix, and he was like recommending this this thing, Breaking Bad, and I was like, I've heard of it, but I've never known about it. But I, I I'm always fascinated by the process. I'm like, how do things become things? So I, I read into it, and I he the person uh, Vince, who's the the creator, took him about two years to get it made. Right, every network said no, said no. They were like, no, can't do it. And I think VF or VX is the network that said, okay, we're going to green this. They then got it to a pilot and then um, AMC then came back on board and then bought the show off that network and then they made it and then Netflix saw it and then they bought it off. But originally everyone said, no, it's not great or there's something like this in the pipe work already. And I just love like, that sort of like process that it is one of the best shows apparently ever made, right? It's At the amazing. beginning everyone said no and I mm. love that because it gives people the opportunity and the uh, optimism that just because people say no for Breaking Bad the first time which is one of the greatest shows your project you just got to find the right person to say that one yes and I love 100%. those stories yeah never give up never ever give up honestly I, I've heard so many of those stories and it's dangerous it is dangerous because it can over inspire you and genuinely you can have like a very bad idea in your head and be like, no, this is the one. <laughs> but wow. mostly, um, but mostly I live by that because I, um, I genuinely think that if you're, if you're passionate enough about something, then it will be heard. And also you see all those, have you ever seen those cartoons where there's that guy chipping against a wall, like trying to look for gold and then he gives up and then, the guy above him is like chipping and he doesn't and he sees this bottle of gold. That's life. That is life. Mm -hmm. So um, just but how, chipping away. How do you know if it's a good idea or bad idea? Because I'm like, I don't know if you remember Teletubbies. I mean, who's, who, <laughs> who, who like, who said that was a great idea? <laughs> yeah, but also, I, I also feel that in, in a way it doesn't matter because it's better to keep going with it and that completely and utterly be rubbish and you still have done it, then not to have done it at all. So I think, honestly, I love the fact that something like Teletubbies went ahead because yeah, okay, well, this works, this doesn't work, this is where this, but my God, like how, who knows what that spawned creatively? Do you know, know what I mean? Who knows? Who, Everything who, is valid. Who was your favorite Teletubbies? Poe. Who? Poe. Poe. Is Poe the red one? <laughs> yeah, I think Poe's the red one. Mine was the, mine was the 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 um the vacuum. Oh, <laughs> I loved. I just loved it. There it is. And he'd have like the, the the pink goo on the floor, the purple goo, and then you'd be like, oh, and then oh, I don't know it that much. I I remember it so. And then you come along and like, do the thing. That was my favorite. But yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's so funny, isn't it? Like how things become things. And so I kind of want to kind of go on to what is. What when you when you kind of do your burlesque show, how how does it kind of I don't know how does it make you feel when you do it because it's it's such a like when I ask people this all the time with when they do acting when they do uh, arts and crafts and how does it make you feel doing it like I want to know that like when I when I create something or when I work with people it just makes me feel invincible like I just feel like yeah. I'm just doing something so special I'd love to know what it personally feels for you. Um, well, the, the sensation has very much evolved over time, um, but how it makes me feel is like, um, kind of like a stripped wire, like there's a million light bulbs going off in my head, mm. and they're exploding, like my eyeballs are about to blow out of my face, like there's absolutely no ceiling between myself and space yeah. that is infinitely expanding. I know that sounds bizarre, but like it's, oh. it, I literally feel connected. You know that scene in The Matrix where he suddenly sees all the code? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, for like a brief moment in time, I feel that rush and open brainness. And it's just unbelievable mm. because you're expressing yourself, you don't give a shit, and you're doing something you love. and the feedback of the audience and it just, it, if you're doing something that your soul is yearning to do, it just electrifies you in a way that is, is almost inexplainable. 
it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a movement. It's an arm gesture. It's, it's this. That's the word. So I don't know how you spell that, or know. whether it begins with a W or like a H, but it's that. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. And so what I want to kind of do uh, as we kind of near towards our end of our episode is I'd love to do this thing where we do a give back. So we we touch upon loads of different um, aspects of like your life and our thoughts and stuff. And I would love to know what has inspired you, whether it's been like a painting or someone that you've met or a mantra that you do every morning, what would you give back to our audience to inspire them? What has really inspired me um, is Muhammad Ali's I am the greatest because I know damn well I'm not the greatest. I will put my hand on my heart and say, I'm not the greatest. I'm not the greatest at what I do, like Madonna's not the greatest, like Cher's not the greatest. But when you brainwash yourself to believe you are the best, you will become the best. And in the best, you'll realize your definition of the best is actually not what the best is. The best is the best human being you could ever conceivably possibly become. And you will achieve everything you wanted to, even if it's not in the way that you thought you had, if you just believe that you have the potential, you are, you brainwash yourself every single morning or every day going, yes, I can, and I am the greatest, then you will become it. And I think self-belief is the most powerful tool uh, uh, rather than like, waiting for people to say I'm proud of you look in the mirror every single morning and say I am proud of you I love that I truly believe that and then you'll be able to accomplish anything good I love that I, you can't see it, everyone but she's pointing at herself like yes I love it yes <laughs> <laughs> mindfulness is so important like self-belief and having that sort of mantra and I, t- I tell people to write kind of um the same sentence and my mantra every morning yeah, for people that would love to know maybe you don't want to know but I, I think it's very important and I think find it, it's important for my daily routine is I always recite the same thing I say I am the captain of your ship I'm the master of my fate and I absolutely love that because I'm steering my life I'm steering my journey and we we can control everything that we want to if you can get your mindset in the right place and I think that self-belief is going well why can't we do that why can't I do that why can't I do that and I'm I think it it attaches on to kind of Kevin Hart. If if anyone follows Kevin Hart, he says like, I'm an actor, I'm a comedian, but why can't I be a producer? Why can't I own a a wine business? Why can't I do? And it is, why not? If someone else has done it, you can do it. And I love that Mm -hmm. that self-belief in yourself. So I think every morning you you need to look at yourself in the mirror and go, I can, I am brilliant. I am the greatest version of myself. Um, And so I I absolutely giving you a massive round of applause because I obviously believe 100% what you're saying. So again, I want to say thank you so much for coming on 360 Yourself. It's been absolute delight and we've chatted about loads of different things um, and I'm really excited to see what you do next. I I am. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's been amazing. Cheers.